So Pompey is dead, murdered on the Egyptian coast. The order was given by the eunuch Pothinus, a close advisor to King Ptolemy of Egypt. Plutarch writes, Caesar went in pursuit of Pompey, came to Alexandria, where Pompey was already murdered. Then we find out that Caesar was shown Pompey's head. Plutarch writes, He would not look upon Theodotus, who presented him with his head. This story has some notoriety and it finds its way into many of the pop culture iterations involving Caesar's life. We see the moment where Caesar cries for Pompey and begrudges his death at the hands of the Egyptians. Interesting, though, to look at Lucan, quoted in uh, Michel de Montaigne, in his, his essay, essay number 38, How We Cry and Laugh for the Same Thing. Here's what uh, Michel de Montaigne writes. When they presented Caesar with the head of Pompey, the histories say, he turned his eyes away as from an ugly and unpleasant sight. There had been such a long understanding and association between them in the management of public affairs and so close an alliance that we must not believe that Caesar's countenance was entirely false and counterfeit, as this man supposes, Lucan. And then, and here we go, he quotes Lucan. And now he saw it was safe to be a good father-in-law. Out came false tears, groans from his happy breast. And in that same essay, uh, Montaigne goes on to quote, a Publilius Cyrus, an heir's tears, or a laugh behind the mask. <laughs> okay, so while Caesar is in Egypt, there is an incident where he meets Cleopatra and he's very taken with her, her guile, the way she sneaks into the, the palace um, without being seen, and he places her as joint ruler on the throne. Caesar's barber then discovers a plot uh, to kill Caesar himself. This is, these are Plutarch's words about the, the barber. Excessive timidity made him inquisitive into everything. Discovered that there was a plot carrying on against Caesar by Achilles, general of the king's forces. Is that a correct assessment of human nature? I have never really quite thought of it like that. Timidity makes you inquisitive into everything. The inquiring person is what, a, a, a naturally fearful, nervous type? Interesting. Maybe. Now, of course, on discovering this plot, Pothinus is killed. Plutarch writes about what the Egyptians did next. When the enemy endeavored to cut off his communication by sea, he was forced to divert that danger by setting fire to his own ships, which after burning the docks, then spread on and destroyed the great library. Oh, this is not a fun anecdote, is it? All those books up in flames, all that knowledge gone. It's surprising Plutarch does not dwell on Caesar's time in Egypt for very long. He does tell us that Caesar fights Achilles in battle and defeats him. And after this battle, King Ptolemy is lost for good. But from here, Caesar goes to Asia, where Mithridates' son, Pharnaces, has defeated a Roman army. Caesar immediately marched against him with three legions, fought him near Zella, drove him out of Pontus, and totally defeated his army. When he gave Amantius, a friend of his at Rome, an account of this action to express the promptness and rapidity of it, he used three words. I came, saw, and conquered. Plutarch tells us that Caesar returned to Italy and was made dictator for a second time. Cato and Scipio raise an army in Africa. Now Caesar has to go and sail to Africa in order to deal with them. Caesar learns that Scipio believes in an oracle that says the Scipio family cannot lose in Africa. Caesar, being ever superstitious, does this. There was in his army a man, otherwise mean and contemptible, but of the house of the Africani, and his name, Scipio Saludio. This man, Caesar, put at the head of his troops as if he were general in all the frequent battles which he was compelled to fight. Isn't that funny? That's how superstitious he is. Scipio placed in front so that the Scipio can win in Africa. For a time, there were some skirmishes in which Caesar actually does not do very well. Plutarch tells us that he was not particularly well equipped. But when the final battle does come, it's a little astonishing. Caesar is up against three armies. One under Afranius, another under Juba, who is a Numidian king, and one under Scipio. Plutarch writes, Caesar, with incredible dispatch, made his way through thick woods and a country supposed to be impassable, cut off one part of the enemy and attacked another in the front. Having routed these, he followed up his opportunity and on the first onset carried Afranius' camp and ravaged that of the Numidians. 
so that in a small part of a single day he made himself master of three camps and killed 50,000 of the enemy with the loss only of 50 of his own men. Of course, it is after this battle that Cato kills himself. Caesar's military genius seems well past questioning. So Caesar returns to Rome in triumph, and there is a great grand feast for the whole Roman population. Plutarch writes, 22,000 dining couches were laid out, and he made a display of gladiators. Now, also importantly, we get a census. This is interesting. When these shows were over, an account was taken of the people who, from 320,000, were now reduced to 150,000. So great a waste had the civil war made in Rome alone, not to mention what the other parts of Italy and the provinces suffered. Now, I don't, understand, I don't know whether or not this 320,000 number is from before the civil war between Caesar and Pompey, or if that number traces all the way back to before the civil war between Marius and Sulla. Because we've had two civil wars within a half century, right? So we need to remember this, what Rome has gone through, right? The next part of the story is that Caesar has to go to Spain to deal with Pompey's sons. And now it is here that I want to take notice of something about the way this all shakes out. The old Republican personalities, Pompey, Cato, Scipio, they seem to find all of their support from outside Italy. Have we noticed this? Have we noticed that Cato and Scipio had to go to Africa, that when they were under Pompey and uh, in the first place, they had to go out to Greece and raise their armies in Syria and, and, and Greece and Turkey? I think that's interesting. And like, like we had said at the end of the Pompey 2 video, it, it seems as though Caesar had consolidated his support in Italy. And so therefore, it is something of an amusing paradox. Rome wanted an empire. The empire wanted a republic. That's where they're out getting all these forces, within the broad provinces of the empire. And that has to be contrasted with the resistance that the people made against Sulla. If we remember the, the defense of the city against Sulla, when he burned his way in, the citizens of Rome were throwing rocks on him. He had to do that. He was meeting partisan resistance upon his entry into the city. None of that here. Caesar can approach Rome with a tiny force and all of Italy submits to him. That is what happened. An incredible juxtaposition exists there. Something, as like I had said before in the other videos, something happened to shift the mood. So this is the good time to transition. As Plutarch writes, his countrymen, conceding all to his fortune and accepting the bit, in the hope that the government of a single person would give them time to breathe after so many civil wars and calamities made him dictator for life. So this is a profound moment. And especially for Americans who don't, you know, like me, who don't know anything about suffering. I don't know anything about suffering. I don't know what it's like to live in a city that loses more than half its population over the course of a war. And I, I can't predict what my political attitude would be after that. And so it, it stands, we have to wonder to what extent the, Republican, uh, the Republic failed. The need for order, we look at the need for order now as a pathetic excuse for tyranny. However, order is probably also not supposed to be scoffed at in every context. And that chaos and violence in perpetuity are not freedom's purpose, even if we would consider them freedom's cost. Disorder is not a virtuous aim, right? Right or wrong, I think the Italians had had enough of it. Disorder. They had had enough of it. And so then I think the story of the calendar almost serves as a kind of metaphor for the ridiculousness of these old Republicans in the face of Caesar and how far they took their I'm going to be anachronistic and call it a kind of libertarian mindset, uh, even though that's not quite, that's anachronistic, definitely. But when we consider the calendar, the old calendar was hilariously bad. Plutarch writes, the people had no way of computing the solar year. They essentially had no real calendar that kept pace with the seasons. So bad were their calendars, you know, they would cycle around so December wouldn't be, wouldn't be winter anymore. December would suddenly be spring. That was how stupid their calendar was. It's a nice reminder. You know, we think of Rome being at a, a sort of civilized pinnacle, but the Coriolanuses to the Catos to the Ciceros didn't know how to tell time. It's just 
<laughs> so here's what they did about it. Caesar called in the best philosophers and mathematicians of his time to settle the point, and out of the systems he had before him, formed a new and more exact method of correcting the calendar, which the Romans use to this day. So he has simply changed the calendar to work better. And yet consider the next line from Plutarch. Yet even this gave offense to those who looked with an evil eye on his position and felt oppressed by his power. All right, it's one thing to be against tyranny. Tyranny's a real thing. The correction of the calendar? He couldn't correct the calendar without making these old Republicans feel like they were oppressed? I think it, the anecdote might tell us the neglect that let tyranny creep in. We must blame the neglectful for the tyranny that results, even if they fought it, were against it, and hate it. Neglect leads to that result. Okay. It's almost like they, like a, it's like they give opposition to tyranny a bad name, these Ciceros, and that they've kind of fetishized inaction into a definition of civic virtue, which is not right. These idiots. Idiots. So what begins to happen now is that there are rumblings that Caesar wants to be king. He tries to squash these rumblings himself, but there were people would salute him as a king. Laurels were play of kingship were placed on his statues, and it seemed that his enemies were conniving to make it look like he was trying to be king. So this is a persistent strategy in politics to manipulate the political stage to make the other side seem crazier than they are and, and to make your side seem more moderate than they are. Both Caesar and the Republicans seem to have relied on this tactic. We see this in the anecdote about the Lupercalia celebration, where Mark Antony three times presented Caesar with a kingly crown that, in Shakespeare's words, he did thrice refuse. And what is that, if not a planting of an opportunity for Caesar to be able to make that public gesture? Regarding the stupidity of the people, Plutarch writes in his life of, of Antony, a curious thing enough that they should submit with patience to the fact, and yet at the same time dread the name as the destruction of their liberty, that the mere title of king would change that much. How ridiculous. Theater. There's always an element of staged bullshit in political discourse. So Plutarch seems convinced that the multitude turned their thoughts to Marcus Brutus, but it is hard to say what the multitude truly felt. I don't want to overestimate the caprice of any people. That'd be quite a turn. And Plutarch relates that Brutus was getting anonymous notes left for him that accused him of being unworthy of his family name. We must remember that Brutus was considered to be a direct descendant of that Lucius Brutus that Plutarch writes about in the life of Poplicola. And Lucius Brutus was considered a founding father of the Roman Republic, delivering Rome from the old monarchy and from kingship. So Plutarch begins to transition into the narrative leading up to Caesar's assassination. He relates the soothsayer, a certain soothsayer, bade him prepare for some great danger on the Ides of March. When this day was come, Caesar, as he went to the Senate, met this soothsayer and said to him by way of raillery, the Ides of March are come. Who answered him calmly, yes, they are come, but they are not past. Now, there are differing reports of the famous dream that Calpurnia had before the day of Caesar's death. One was that she held him in her arms, butchered. The other was that a pinnacle which had been raised for Caesar had come tumbling down. She expressed her wish to him that morning that she not that he not go to the Senate that day. He consulted his diviners, and they agreed with her, and so he resolved to send Antony to dismiss the Senate. But in this juncture, Decimus Brutus, surnamed Albinius, one whom Caesar had such confidence in that he made him his second heir, who nevertheless was engaged in a conspiracy with the other Brutus and Cassius, spoke scoffingly, and in mockery of the diviners. Caesar was ultimately convinced that it was more decent for him to go to the Senate and adjourn it in person. And so he goes to the Senate. Here are some of the words. The place which was destined for the scene of this murder, 
in which the Senate met that day was the same in which Pompey's statue stood. Cassius, just before the act, is said to have looked towards Pompey's statue and silently implored his assistance. When he was sat down, that is Caesar, Tilius, laying hold of his robe with both his hands, pulled it down from his neck, which was the signal for the assault. Casca gave him the first cut in the neck, which was not mortal nor dangerous. Caesar immediately turned about and laid his hand upon the dagger and kept hold of it. Casca, what does this mean? he asked him. But those who came prepared for the business enclosed him on every side with their naked daggers in their hands, which way soever he turned he met with blows and saw their swords leveled at his face and eyes and was encompassed like a wild beast in the toils on every side. For it had been agreed they should each of them make a thrust at him and flush themselves with his blood. And the conspirators themselves were many of them wounded by each other whilst they all leveled their blows at the same person. So after Caesar's death, Plutarch makes, makes this statement about his legacy. That empire and power which he had pursued through the whole course of his life with so much hazard, he did at last with much difficulty compass, but reaped no other fruits from it than the empty name and invidious glory. But the great genius which attended him through his lifetime, even after his death, remained as the avenger of his murder, pursuing through every sea and land all those who were concerned in it, and suffering none to escape but reaching all who in any sort or kind were either actually engaged in the fact or by their counsels any way promoted it. The most remarkable of mere human coincidences was that which befell Cassius, who when he was defeated at Philippi, killed himself with the same dagger which he had made use of against Caesar. All right, so a few things on the legacy of Caesar. Uh, first of all, I think his assassination denied him the chance of being the author of his own demise. He, he was planning on a military excursion that would have brought him into war with the Parthians that would then continue over the Caucasus and into Scythia and then back across Europe and into Germany. That campaign, if he had actually been allowed to go through with it, is, it it's almost certain that would it would have ended in disaster and that would, it would have been his Napoleon in Russia moment. Even supposing that he could have defeated the Parthians, which would have been difficult. The moment he crossed over those mountains of modern-day Georgia, those Caucasus, where Azerbaijan and Georgia are, that's modern-day Russia, and that region on the other side of it is the steppes. And the Romans had no experience yet, I don't think, of the dangers of the steppes, where hordes of horse warriors roamed. It's an incredible... No one succeeded there. Huge hordes of Hunnish types or Mongols would just go galloping across that flat land and they would rout you. You couldn't traverse that. If he had tried to pull that, I think he and his whole army actually would have disappeared without a trace and it'd be a big mystery. So from here, Caesar lays dead and Mark Antony must now give his speech.